right now on the National Weather Desk. Our week of wild weather finishes with a blizzard warning in California and cleanup efforts from coast to coast. All of this could turn to ice. That is an extremely dangerous situation. The power should be back on by Sunday, but that could stretch into Monday. Some people have still not been able to shovel their way out of their homes. We'll also show you where folks are surfing in very cold weather and a sure sign spring is on the way. The only time we get concerned is when the petals start to emerge. Also, how these so-called ice eggs appear on the shores of a great lake and the trees that could help keep cities cool in the summer. Trees can reduce temperatures by 20 degrees in certain areas. From our nation's capital, this is the National Weather Desk. Good morning and welcome to the National Weather Desk. I'm Angela Brown. Right now, a rare blizzard warning is in effect for the mountains in California. That includes portions of Los Angeles and Ventura counties. The National Weather Service says 36 to 85 inches of snow could fall at elevations above 8 thousand feet along with wind gusts of 70 miles per hour that means wind chills could dip to 7, 30 degrees below zero the blizzard warning is in effect until tomorrow afternoon this is what it looks like this morning this comes from Caltrans camera at Lake Gregory about 75 miles from Los Angeles you can see wind is already whipping the trees and also blowing the snow and nearby at Big Bear Lake. This is their first ever blizzard warning in effect from Friday until 4 p.m. Saturday. Travel is already difficult, if not impossible. Roads in San Bernardino Mountains were already snow covered last night. Many drivers got stuck in the snow. People are also losing power. More than 100,000 customers, mostly in Northern California, have no power this morning. Mountain communities have seen their share of snow this week. Shaver Lake got plenty to cover the road and landscape into town. According to PG&E's team of meteorologists, expect wild weather from now through Saturday. Crews are standing by in the mountain. Snow levels this week have been extremely low in the foothills. The big cats at Cat Haven and Dunlap saw it piling up on their perches where they relax. It's a given the wild weather will produce outages in Central California. PG&E crews are already up the hill waiting to see what problems the storm will produce. And now to the winter storm that hit cities from the Pacific Northwest through the Midwest and into New England. This morning, people are still cleaning up, digging out, and wondering when the power will come back on. Two of the hardest hit areas are Portland, Oregon, and Southern Michigan. A record-setting snowfall in Portland brought highways there to a standstill. Transportation officials are asking drivers to stay off the roads today. The concern is that the streets will quickly refreeze. While in Michigan, more than 700,000 power customers are still in the dark today. Power there may not be restored until Sunday or even later. We have reporters in both states as well as New York this morning. But let's start in Michigan with reporter Jessica Hawthorne. It's now being called an unusual storm. Consumers Energy saying that this is the third time in the last decade it's seen an ice storm like this. Now the energy company is thanking customers for their patience as hundreds of crews continue to work around the clock to restore power. Consumers Energy says that Kalamazoo and Calhoun counties were hit hardest in the southern tier of Michigan. A half inch of ice coating power lines and trees. Energy officials say a half inch of ice on power lines makes a 20 mile per hour wind as damaging as a 60 mile per hour wind without the ice. Consumers Energy says that this melting ice made restoration challenging for its 450 crews on the road. Thousands of trees still across access roads making it hard for crews to get to those down wires. Literally zero notification about this. I noticed people are actually leaving their cars. We're encouraging people to stay home if at all possible. After record-setting snowfall, Portland Transportation Commissioner Mingus Mapp says they hope the worst is behind us. And we should have been in communication with the business community uh, um, and just encouraging folks uh, um, from businesses to the school districts to maybe try to get your, uh, your people and your kids home safe. Uh, that's important. Uh, that's important so we can get our equipment out there to keep the, the roads clear. Uh, it would have gone much faster if we were able to do that. Um, I really take responsibility on uh, for that myself. One driver heading to Clark County said he was stuck in traffic for roughly eight hours. And we just sat there for hours and hours and hours. And by the time we finally got to the bridge, you realize what's going on. The whole bridge is a sheet of ice. There's not a hint of gravel on the thing. 
and, and you're looking around at everyone going, oh my goodness, no, you know, no one is prepared for this. Map says now Peabot is focused on Friday and clearing main roads before temperatures dip below freezing again. If it warms up enough uh, during the day and then freezes again, all of this could turn to ice. That is an extremely dangerous situation. Falling tree branches, down power lines, and no power. That's what many people woke up to Thursday morning after an ice storm. My brand new fence. <laughs> How much is that going to cost me? Roberta Campbell is taking a look at the damage done after her neighbor's tree limb fell in the back of her Pittsford home. At about 7.15, we heard a loud crash, and then like the, it's like, like a little earthquake, and then all the power went out. And we looked out back, and this tree behind me just came all the way down and took out my, my new fence and um, the power lines here. Arborist Jason Cramner was out surveying damage, but says he found more down tree branches than anything. You're going to see that mostly in trees like this, like a white pine. That's what this is. Uh, softer wood still has the needles on it, so it's holding all that extra weight from the ice. And in Utah, residents are still feeling the effects from that severe storm. Snow totals topped two feet in some cities and peaked even higher in Utah's mountains where snow fell for nearly 24 hours. Salt Lake City received 17.3 inches, the second highest two day snowfall total in February on record. A day after a large storm in Utah, some people have still not been able to shovel their way out of their homes. This is Tooele, where they got around two feet of snow. I'm in an 83 year old woman's front yard. You can see her car is covered. She says she is not going anywhere. Well, luckily, some relief is on the way. The high today for Salt Lake City is 41 degrees with mostly sunny skies. The same system also dumped snow across portions of northern New England. Six to seven inches fell in many parts of Maine. Portland is still more than a foot below average for this time of the year. So in a state that embraces winter, some people got out and enjoyed the snow. There's a ton of snow out here, so why not? It's a nice day to get out, get a little exercise. This is the first time for me this year. There hasn't been much snow, but it, it was a blast. Next, next up is bitter cold. Temperatures tonight will dip to single digits or even below freezing in some areas. This week's winter storm has left Green Bay, Wisconsin behind, but the piles of snow are sticking around. Folks in this neighborhood outside of the city had a little help from their neighbors to start the cleanup, like one family that, received, that recently moved from Miami. So, of course, it was like a huge difference, but we really found a good home here. We have great neighbors. Ran out of battery and, and uh, still had quite a bit left on the end of the driveway, so uh, went over, helped out, and, and got the rest of it moved for him. What do you think about all this snow and not having to go to school and be at home? Uh, good, because I like how deep it is. I make a whole house. Gray attitude there. The weather has taken a turn. There could be some passing snow showers tonight. These are expected to clear up for a bit, but the area might be in for a messy wintry mix on Monday. While the brutal winter in the Midwest sent many people inside this week, that was not the case for a fearless group of surfers in Duluth, Minnesota. There are only a few days out of the year when the conditions work just right for surfable waves on the Great Lakes. These brave surfers took advantage of the strong winds Thursday, donning their wetsuits and taking on icy Lake Superior in single digit temperatures. And while the West and Midwest froze, the East was enjoying spring and summer like heat. Scores of city broke long standing records on Thursday. And here are just a few of the records that fell. Temperatures hit 85 degrees in Nashville, Raleigh, North Carolina, and Savannah, Georgia. It topped 87 degrees in Jackson, Mississippi, and in our nation's capital, it was a balmy 81 degrees. And here's a sure sign spring isn't far away. Washington, D.C.'s annual cherry blossom bloom has already started. They hit stage one yesterday, meaning these small green buds have emerged. It's the first of six stages to peak bloom. The peak bloom forecast will be announced next week, but typically it's in late March or early April. And coming up on the National Weather Desk, we'll take a look at how the unusually warm winter has been bad news for some crops, for some farmers. Plus, we'll find out the unique approach the city is taking to combat ch climate change. All that coming up.
are watching the National Weather Desk. Welcome back, everyone. Take a look at these orbs right here. They kind of resemble donut holes, but they're actually something called ice balls. Another name for them, ice eggs. A viewer in Wisconsin spotted these along the shores of Lake Michigan. Wisconsin is one of many states that has gotten a layer of snow this week. These spheres form near the shore when choppy water breaks up a layer of slushy ice. And as those winter storms and ice slammed parts of the country this week, others enjoyed record-breaking warmth. While the unseasonably warm temperatures can be enjoyable for some, it has others in North Carolina pretty worried about their fruit trees. Rex Hodge has more. The peaches are still, I mean, the, the blooms are swelled. Taylor says they shouldn't be at this stage until early March. Your blooms are swelled, and then this white here, will turn pink, and then it's within two or three days they're gonna bloom. Timing is everything with peaches. We get some cold weather, they may back off. If we don't, it'll be another bad season. If we have a cold spell and they're in full bloom, we can spray with some fungicide. The bloom will still get burnt, but it saves the bud where the peach come from. But temperatures too low for too long at the wrong time puts a successful peach crop in jeopardy especially early blooming pluots a cross between a plum and apricot anything below 27 for about four hours is going to kill your crop taylor well aware that the remainder of winter could still bring cold temperatures these peach trees translate into money you're probably looking at a forty thousand dollar crop here if it's lost taylor says his insurance only covers a tiny fraction so he takes steps to save it i've got them all trimmed We'll spray this week with a good fungicide and hope for the best. As a small operation, he says, protecting against any future freezes with a wind tower is cost prohibitive. That's way over my head. Taylor says his apple trees bloom about a month after peach trees, so they're in good shape, along with his raspberries and blackberries. And in some parts of Utah, it's been a different story. It's been snow upon snow upon snow. That can mean bad news for some making it difficult to travel and really just to go about daily life. But others, of course, are loving it. Amanda Gilbert has the story from Brighton, which is near Salt Lake City. Around 300 people live in Brighton. Snow this high is no surprise for locals like Monica Dietz, who's been here for 33 years. I'm never sick of the snow. If I'm up here for 33 years, there's a reason I'm up here. Still, she says this is the most powder she's seen in the past decade outside her home. A two-story house, and um, I'm about six feet away from walking over the top of my roof. Right here, the snow's about five feet tall, and that's just this driveway. We're calling for 32 to 42 inches in the next two days. Brighton's Mayor Dan Knoops, also the town's snow removal service. He's been busy clearing driveways and neighborhood roads. I have 160 of these. He says houses are buried. She has a Tesla was parked in front of her house. Her roof unloaded and flattened the Tesla. Just totaled it. And the snows made it hard to see when driving. You're in like a little mouse maze. So people come down one road and come up the other road and we've had collisions. Monica says soon the view outside the first floor of Brighton Lodge will be gone. It'll be full. Perfect. She'll just fill her in. But they're ready for these huge piles to just grow. Well, we all know that snow is more common in mountain locations than Brighton than at, like Brighton than at lower elevations. But do you know why it's often warmer in cities than rural locations? It's called urban heat island effect. And Seattle meteorologist Theron Zahn explains why it happens. You may never have heard of the term heat island, but it's a term used to describe why cities tend to be warmer than the outlying areas. There's several reasons for this. Uh, the material cities are made of, you can see the pavement down there, that uh, basically retains heat, making for a warmer area. Also, taller buildings can restrict uh, the wind moving through. That would typically have a cooling effect, and also human activity in a city generates its own heat. How much warmer can cities be? Well, during the day, one to seven degrees warmer than the outlying countryside, and at night, two to five degrees warmer. 
A few degrees warmer doesn't seem like a lot, but as te average temperatures are increasing overall, those few numbers can start to make a big difference. So what can cities do to try and cool things down? Sonia Stevens takes a look at one unique approach being taken in Charleston, South Carolina. You might walk by this sensor and not even notice it, but it's taking in important data like temperature and relative humidity. There are 20 of them located near Hampton Park in downtown Charleston on trees and light poles. We wanted to look at the effect of vegetation and how it can cool the city. So there is a lot of research showing that trees can reduce temperatures by 20 degrees in certain areas compared to areas um, without vegetation. But Dr. Shetty and his team are getting even more specific with their research. All the previous research has focused on comparing a neighborhood with trees to a neighborhood without trees. And there's no research that looks at um, how different species can react and kind of at a very local scale. The one big surprise in the data? So we found that a little bit counterintuitive that the, the live oaks are such a big tree, we would think they would do the most cooling. There's more branches and lower to the ground, whereas live oaks, they begin so high and it's kind of above the sensor and there's more mixing below them. A few degrees might not seem like a big deal, but in a warming world, every little bit counts and seeing how it kind of scales up across the city and how we can then retrofit the city um, to install new vegetation in a way that most benefits um, the environment. And another thought on the minds of those in Charleston, the hurricane season is getting closer and closer. So when is it time to start forecasting how intense this season will be? To find out, we head to meteorologist Lauren Oleski in West Palm Beach, Florida. We are now less than 100 days out from the start of the Atlantic hurricane season. Here's our name list for the year. First up is Arlene and then Brett and Cindy. And then, of course, we continue to go down the rest of the alphabet. Now, on average, we see 14 named storms per season. These numbers are recalculated every decade. So the 30 year average we're now looking at runs from 1991 through the 2020 season, which of course was the most active season uh, on record. That was a very, very busy hurricane year. So when can we expect to start to see some of this information coming out? Well, at the end of March, that's when we typically see the retired names from the previous year. So from last year's season, Colorado State University usually releases their forecast in April and then they update it throughout the year. NOAA also updates their forecast throughout the season. They usually release theirs in May. Hurricane preparedness week is May 1st through May 7th uh, of this year. And then, of course, hurricane season begins on Thursday, June 1st. And if you want to see more videos like this that help you learn about the weather, check us out on social media. You can find us on all of your favorite platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. Just search the National Weather Desk or scan the QR code on the bottom left of your screen. The National Weather Desk. Well, we have had some uncommon weather this week. Here's a sample of what you shared and seen with us. Let's start in central New York. Reviewers chimed in with some icy photos. Most of that area saw steady snow for a brief spell, but it morphed into sleet and freezing rain, which caused this cold crustiness right here. Meanwhile, in Asheville, North Carolina area, temperatures were unusually warm, while some doggies like playing um, where it snowed. Banjo right here needed to cool down in this creek. Now to the West Coast in this photo from California. Look at this, different parts of the state that are not known for a frozen precipitation got just that. This viewer described this as hell, but it actually resembles grapple, which is a softer form of hail. To see more photos like this or to share, we just use the hashtag WowWeather on your favorite social media platform. If you post a picture, there's a chance you'll see it right here on the show. And as we head to break, take a peek at this awesome time lapse from our station in Quincy, Illinois. They had widespread rain, but the clouds cleared up in time to see Wednesday's nights lined up of celestial bodies. Those two bright dots you'll see are Jupiter and Venus, and there's the moon, of course, in the back. We'll be right back. heard of using the weather as a weapon? Well, it's something many governments have thought about. Monday, we'll talk with an expert about what exactly it means to use weather as a weapon. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Angela Brown. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you right back here on Monday.